line that Sue did earlier. It was hectic, hey? I feel so far away from you guys. There was a lot of um, information that our kids learned. I was wondering, before we start this morning, if Pastor Barry was teaching you guys about Moses. I'm sure it would take you guys a lot longer than five days, hey? Our kids are just so smart, hey? Just think about it. Moses' story in found is found in Exodus, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and Numbers. And you guys started Romans how many weeks ago? <laughs> what chapter are you guys on? Three. Chapter three. Three weeks. I'm just, I'm just kidding. But we're going to take a break from Romans this morning and look at the whole story of um, Moses. If you attended the parent evening, you'll hear a little bit of overlap this morning, but I'm sure repetition is not a bad thing. When Sue and I were putting together the program and teaching times and for the children, we had this heart to really break down the teachings into bite sizes throughout the day so that the kids could hear the whole story of Moses and hear it and, and see it in different ways. We had all these like little threads throughout the day that were so intentionally put together that we knew that everything we did was going to share part of the message or be a reminder of what we had learned that day. Whether it was, you know, the timeline, the drama, the game, the worship, prayer time, the message. The week before, two weeks before, we showed this to Barry, Danae, Jordan um, about the Holiday Bible Club when we were preparing it. It's a kind of like a weaving thing. And if I put these threads in the right place, you can see the whole picture. And that's kind of what we thought, that every little part that we were putting into our week or our day would have a little bit of the story sewn into it. And it was also important to put in, whether it was the drama or the worship or the games, we had to weave it in so that the kids could get a full picture of the story of Moses. And so it's like a tapestry that we were looking at. I have a picture here of a tapestry um, of Moses' moments with God. <sighs> Man, I searched and searched for a really good picture. Even with the lights off, it's not going to be great. Anyways, this tapestry is quite a famous tapestry, and it's of Moses handing down his leadership to Joshua. You can't even see it from here. But you can see there was a border around it. Can you kind of see there's a border around it? Anyways, the borders was all the stories of Moses leading up to that moment. And I wanted to ask you guys this morning, if your life was seen as a tapestry, what would be in the border and what would be in the main part? Thank you so much, Sean. I wanted to know for myself what would be in my main part and what would be in my borders. I really hope that God is still working on my borders and I haven't reached my main part yet. But we'll see. You know, when a tapestry is turned around, I, asked, um, I just kind of spoke about it and said, my picture was so horrible, I'm never going to be able to explain this. And Natalie said, my granny does tapestries. So she brought me this one today. Pretty cool. But when we turn a tapestry around, even though we kind of get an idea of what the tapestry would look like, it's not a very clear picture. We can only really see it from the front. And I was thinking about my life and your life, and when we view it as a tapestry, we often only see the back. We don't really see the front of it. It's not as finished and polished as we would like as we look in our own life. When we look at our own God stories, it's quite messy sometimes. We don't fully understand it. You know, I'm sure when Moses looked at his own life, he probably saw more this than this. And things maybe seemed random to him in his life. And even though when I read his story, I can easily see God's hand in his life. Maybe he wasn't so sure about that. Maybe he wasn't so, so sure about his upbringing. Confused about who and what he was and meant to be. An Israelite? A prince in Pharaoh's palace? Or was he just a shepherd? I find it interesting that Moses went from being one of the most envied people in the envied position of living in the palace to being a shepherd, one of the lowliest positions in society. He was a hesitant leader. You know, his burning bush experience did not set him on fire for God, but it was one where he hesitantly negotiated his terms with God. 
However, you see a man start to emerge from that experience with the desire to know God and be known by God. You see, leadership was a heavy burden for him. He struggled with it and he needed assistance. But it allowed God to have access, it allowed Moses to have access to God in a very profound way. And we see this, his story grow. And as we see his story grow, we see him grow as a man growing in his ability and his, in his confidence to lead. But we also see a man who was constantly wanting more of God and wanting more of God's presence. And you know, if you look past all these big moments, all these great miracles, there were so many. Think about it, the burning bush. But even before that, you know how he was saved in the river. His staff that would turn into a snake, imagine that. The plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, the water on tap, the manna, the cloud during the day, the pillar of fire at night, the Ten Commandments, the ordering of the legal system, being put into place for the Israelite nation, them being saved. Think about that. Two million people being in Exodus with him. What an incredible story. But if you look past those miracles, those big moments, and even if you look past his epic fails, I mean, he was far from a perfect man. He murdered a man, then he ran away to live in Midian. He was hesitant when God called him. He struggled with his leadership. The Israelites, they drove him crazy with their constant moaning and groaning. They questioned his leadership, his authority, and did such unbelievably crazy things when Moses turned his attention away from them, even when he turned his attention to God. Just a side note quickly, I just want to say to all the parents there, I see some major correlation between Moses leading those Israelite nation for the 40 years and parenting, you know? And we see a man who was not even allowed into the promised land because he had a moment where he did not listen to God. Instead, he listened to the people's grumbling and complaining. But when you look past all of that, you find a man who was considered by God to be his friend. What a thought, to be considered by God to be his friend. If I could take a golden thread out of the tapestry, of his life, if I could take a thread out of it, out of the Moses God story, and I told you that this, this thread is important, it is so important, it should also be in yours, it would be this part of the story. It would not be about doing more, performing miracles, being chased down by Pharaoh and his army, the cloud that protected them, or the fire at night, it would not be the plagues, or even the forming of the nation in the Ten Commandments, it would be Moses relationship with God. It would be his honest conversations with God. It would be his burning bush hesitant moments. It would be going up the mountain to be away with God. It would be about Moses asking God to reveal more of himself to him. It would be a two-way friendship. I wanted to read um, a part of that conversation and part of that friendship from Exodus 33. And I've asked two people just to help me. So I've chosen from the message because it just had a really beautiful way of doing it between the two. And we're gonna read it word for word, um, but I've asked Moses to come join me this morning and to do it. <laughs> Thank you, Moses. So it's Exodus 33 and it's verses 12 onwards to the end of that chapter. Is God ready? No, not yet. We're just waiting for God to get ready. Sorry, did I steal his microphone? Moses stole the microphone. Sorry. Okay, we're getting everybody into place. <clears throat> Thank you, guys. Look, you tell me, lead this people, but you don't let me know whom you're going to send with me. You tell me, I know you well, and you are special to me. If I'm so special to you, 
Let me in on your plans. That way, I will continue being special to you. Don't forget, this is your people, your responsibility. My presence will go with you. You will see the journey to the end. If your presence doesn't take the lead here, call this trip off right now. How else will, I, will it be known that you're with me in this? With me and your people. Are you traveling with us or not? How else will we know that we're special? I and your people. Among all other people on this planet Earth. All right. Just as you say, this also I will do. For I know you well and you are special to me. I know you by name. Please, let me see your glory. I will make my goodness pass right in front of you. I'll call out your name, God, right before you. I'll treat you well whomever I want to treat well. And I'll be kind to whomever I want to be kind. But you may not see my face. No one can see me and live. Look here is the place right beside me. Put yourself on this rock. When my glory passes by, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed. Then I'll take my hand away and you will see my back, but you won't see my face. Thank you. Thank you, guys. What an incredible, beautiful passage of a conversation between God and Moses. I hear that and I think, if only I was that bold sometimes with God. If only I had that type of relationship with him. So my question to you guys, would God consider you to be his friend? In the last four years, I've really struggled in my faith and in my calling. Not with doubting, but with my theology. I've had to do some serious grappling, and I am still am. And that grappling has made me struggle. Struggle a lot. You know, especially being a woman in ministry, juggling ministry, being a wife, being a mom, wanting to be compassionate but not wanting to be emotional. How do you measure it all? Am I doing enough, being enough? Do I have a proper grasp on theology? Could I even call myself a pastor? As the world is ever changing, the wave of the next generation and their struggles with things like gender identity and sexuality, how do I stand in a way that constantly shows God's love? But I'm going to carry on speaking even though they're going to turn the generator off. Um, in a way that shows love but does not compromise God. Can you even compromise God? I'm not sure. How do I live in a world that is messy and hard and not let go of my faith? It's this. <laughs> this golden thread. This friendship with God. As I'm preparing... Again, I realize that you can spend your days debating all the things about what we believe as Christians, or as churches. I can be swept up. Can you guys still hear me? I can be swept up in all of those things, but if I take hold of this golden thread, it means friendship with God that is honest about my struggles. Not always saying yes because I know what it's, that God desires that of me, but allowing Him into those moments of doubt. And allowing him into those moments where I really struggle, into those spaces, and that through friendship, he's able to move my heart, to constantly trust him more, and to constantly bring every issue before him, just like Moses did. If you read the story of Moses, you'll see no matter how small the demand was, or how big the demand was from the Israelites, Moses never had a little powwow with all his leadership. All he did was, let's go to God and ask. It's a golden thread that counts more than any theology or religious belief or even a morally good life, all of which are important. But without this golden thread, they are all meaningless. You can do all of those things and be exact and know exactly what you believe, but without this golden thread, those things become meaningless. And there's more to this golden thread. You see, it was not just for Moses, but he passed it on to the next generation. Because this thread, it's true, it's full, it's
It's an alive relationship with God, which has eternal value. That when you pass it on to the next generation, it weaves our God stories together. What an incredible thought that we can weave our God stories together. See, when Moses was about to die, he called the Israelites together. In Deuteronomy 32 and 33, two full chapters of Moses speaking to the next generation. He's not filled with regret and focused on all the things he had not done well or right. He spent the time reminding them about who God is and making sure that they were ready for the promised land, a place and a world that Moses would never experience or know himself. He could have just left it and said, you're going, to have, you're going to have that. I'm not going to get involved with that. But he didn't. He made sure they were prepared for that. What a profound thought. As a parent, I'm very aware that my children and grandchildren will never live in a world that I can imagine. I know this because the world is so fast changing. Because of technology, we are forever changed and the pace of our world will move a lot quicker. What a thought that my relationship with God could be a golden thread that has eternal value not only for me, but for my children and for their children. At grade primary, we got to teach the story of Moses to the grade fours to sevens. In one of the classes, we had asked every single class, one of the classes, we asked them what was the highlight of Moses' life. And this one boy said, he thinks the highlight of Moses' life is when he died that Moses had died gently and that God himself had buried him. What a thought. I think that's a beautiful moment to sum up a friendship with God, a friendship that not only had an impact on us here today, our holiday club leaders, our kids that attended the holiday club, but it also had an impact for Moses then and the people around him. And that life had an impact on God himself. So as we end this morning... My question to you is how is your friendship with God? Because that is the golden thread that means everything. Thanks, Tracy.